years ago, when I was young, school children were made to memorize quantities of poetry. Some of it stuck, especially bad poetry. The celebration of the 60th anniversary of the founding of the association brought back to consciousness one such verse, and I propose to inflict it upon you. Here goes. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Now by definition, founders are great men and women. But I was cynical enough to suspect that what they had said and written might well have been obliterated as the windiness of 60 years of academic discourse, which incidentally has included a fair amount of hot air, <laughs> shifted the sands on which they may have left their mark. It is a common complaint among senior anthropologists that nobody reads them anymore. <laughs> Indeed, one of my Berkeley colleagues recently told me, no one is important for more than about 20 years. Who now pays attention to the people we thought important in the 1950s and 1960s? So I did some research, or rather, at a citation check made by Suzanne Kopeskri, the epitome of the research librarian that every anthropologist ought to have at hand. I gave her the names of 10 founders and asked her to check for citations from the list from the 1st of January, 2005. Amazingly, all 10 of them are still being cited, although the majority have been dead these 30 years or more. What they wrote is still an active part of the intellectual heritage of anthropology. But more of that later. One important footprint they undoubtedly left, that is the association itself. Even though it has grown out of all knowledge and no longer provides a forum for a small number of people who know each other well and read each other's work. 10 people met in July 1946 discussed the desirability of an association devoted specifically to the furtherance of the interests of social anthropology, and incidentally, social anthropologists as well. Some months later, our committee drew up a list of other potential members, nine of whom, according to David Mills, were based on Great Britain, while another 15 to 20 were scattered around the Commonwealth. They all held postgraduate degrees in anthropology, overwhelmingly from LSE. Fifteen years later, in 1961, the association had grown to include 142 members. And here I am relying on an article by the Arguers. By 1990, by my own count, it had 500 members whose advanced degrees uh, were <coughs> taken at some 55 different universities, including some outside the Commonwealth. The first meeting I attended was held in London in late 1947 or early 1948, a little over a year after the original gathering. I think every member of the association who was then in Great Britain came, which meant there were about 15 of, 15 of us in the room. We fitted easily around a table. I don't remember if anyone gave a paper, but the discussion was collegial and combative. Even then, not everyone spoke up. As a young anthropologist, newly admitted to the August body, and very impressed by the eminence of everyone else, I kept silent. But as a compulsive note taker, I recorded what others said. Unfortunately, these field notes have disappeared over the years. After all, I never expected to write them up. I do remember referring to the occasion as the meeting of the for down the side of the notebook alternated the names of Firth, Ford, Fortis, and Fortune, with <laughs> occasional interpolations from Gluckman, Nadell, Richards, and Mayer, and even rarer comments by Parisiani, Leach, and Little. The last two seem regarded as neophytes. Evans Pritchard was characteristically, expressively silent. In some respects, those who came to London, as well as the absent members, were a cosmopolitan group. They have crossed disciplinary and territorial boundaries in becoming anthropologists. I doubt that any of them started out to be one. After all, before World War II, anthropology was rarely taught as an undergraduate degree in Britain or I think elsewhere in the Commonwealth. 
He came out of history, law, geography, psychology, economics, biology, and engineering. As anthropologists later, they were also prepared to borrow quite freely from other fields whenever they felt themselves felt it was advisable. Those born in Great Britain were in the minority. The remainder of the first group of perhaps 30 members had been born in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and India, the parents, some of whom had never visited Great Britain. Well, Nadell came from Austria and Christiani from Cyprus. Oddly enough, that first group contained no Canadians, which suggests that Canadians of that period, who became anthropologists, looked to the United States. All had traveled outside their home country, and all, at least for a time, lived in Great Britain. They were familiar with cities strung around the globe. Their field research had taken them to different ethnographic regions, to Africa, North America, Asia, and the Pacific. I think none had worked in Europe or South America. Anthropological investigation of cities and peasant communities may already have been envisaged and had already been undertaken by Robert Redfield at Tepestlan, Hortense Pottermaker in the deep south of the United States, and W. Lloyd Warner and his team in the study of Newburyport, Massachusetts. But it was not yet practiced by the social anthropologists of Britain. Money available to them for field research was largely to finance research elsewhere in the Commonwealth, on the colonized rather than the colonizers. Beside their cosmopolitan transcending of boundaries, they had another thing in common. All except myself, Radcliffe Brown, and Brenda Sandman had sat as students in Malinowski's seminar, and at least the latter two had known Malinowski. Subsequently, Malinowski's students may have revolted against him, but they still bore his mark. Whatever else they had read, and in comparison with their American contemporaries, most of them had read very little ethnography. They had all read Malinowski on the programs. Their seminars would be met, modeled on Malinowski's seminar, just as was there enough ethnography in its reliance on particularism in that it involved a search for how activities are interrelated and justified in what later came to be called cognitive models. Along with Malinowski, they assumed thinking actors who might be working from assumptions about reality that could be challenged. But they were nevertheless behaving rationally, given these assumptions. The association you can describe as a dissent group, as well as a guild. Its members recognized this and were quick to differentiate between themselves and others who might claim to be anthropologists. Cosmopolitan sympathies were extended only so far. They had little good to say of American anthropology, except that carried out by Chicago students Bradford Brown. And they were especially dismissive of work labeled culture and personality. They were adamant that various British anthropologists, who were not of the Melanowskian elite, were unworthy of the name, even though they might hold teaching positions in Britain itself. And their ethnographic publications, at least to the outsider, compared well with those admitted to the canon. He or she is not a social anthropologist, with the damning words that consign such persons to an inferior status. While criteria for membership was much discussed in the early years, it was difficult to be certain what they were or how they applied. Having a degree and holding a job in Britain or elsewhere in the Commonwealth were said to be essential, but did not guarantee acceptability. Publication cannot have counted or I wouldn't have been admitted when I was. My degree was from an American university, and I had never laid eyes on Melanowski. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have a job in Northern Rhodesia, so I fell within the Commonwealth. The selection process was influenced by ecological considerations, as much as by a desire to maintain an unsullied line of descent. The goods for which anthropologists competed, jobs and research funds, were limited, determined by conditions not of the anthropologist's making. There were, I think at that time, four professorships in all of Britain, and there were perhaps three or four more scattered throughout the Commonwealth. There was an ex expectation that resources would be more abundant now that the war was over, and the colonial development and welfare funds seemed ready to help finance research institutes and independent fellowships 
those returning to civilian life in 1945 or being released from various government agencies as the war ended, looked upon this as a chance to obtain, uh, to obtain jobs and research funds for themselves and their future students. In such situations, people are likely, likely to operate on what George Foster has called a principle of limited good. And so they tried to limit the number of those who might compete with them for scarce goods. <laughs> the social anthropologists of the 1940s were well aware of how easily disciplinary boundaries could be crossed, and the likelihood that those with little or no formal training in the discipline would be regarded as anthropologists. Some of the few academic posts for anthropologists in Britain were held by people who had learned their anthropology in the job as colonial administrators and missionaries. And a further cadre of such people existed, members in, in good standing of the Royal Anthropological Institute, who might be given consideration as academic posts became available. This gave impetus to the call for a professional association limited to those trained in anthropology in the only schools they saw as capable of providing such training, that of Melanowski and Radcliffe Brown. The year before, similar concerns, incidentally, had led to the reorganization of the American Anthropological Association into a two-tiered body of fellows and members, with only fellows entitled to be regarded as fully qualified professional anthropologists. About a decade later, in the 1950s, in Britain and elsewhere in the Commonwealth, academic jobs and research funding increased substantially for a few years providing funds for the founding of new departments, a large increase in the number of academic jobs, and rather abundant funding for field work. And the inevitable happened. Those interested in anthropology were encouraged to regard it as a viable professional choice, and emerged as well-trained professionals looking for jobs and other funding in a less expansive universe, subject to the competition of those in other fields. The concern with competition has waxed and waned over the years of the association, and probably again resonates strongly among association members in 2006, especially now that boundary jumping is again the order of the day. Everyone is an expert on culture, and sometimes all the world seems to claim to do ethnography. <laughs> One of the expected benefits referred to by Paul Silito when he urged the adoption of measures aimed at increasing the professional status of anthropology is, and I quote, the prevention of the poorly qualified passing themselves off as anthropologists. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that all of them want to be regarded as anthropologists. Many seem quite happy to be geographers, demographers, historians, political scientists, or workers in public health, education policy studies, development studies, crisis management, or cultural studies. It might be more to the point that they could be prevented from passing themselves off as competent ethnographers. That is, if they aren't. Some are doing very good eth ethnographic studies and tread firmly in our footprints, in our ground. Uh, if the people in these fields speak our language and do equally good ethnography, we may need to think again about our own claims on what it is that makes us distinctive. So we need to think afresh. Now members of the uh, new association agreed in 1947 that it was important to create a specialized professional identity for social anthropologists that differentiated them from the many who were interested in anthropology. They were less in agreement about what that identity entailed and about what work was appropriate for social anthropologists. They share the old liberal dream that truth is ascertainable and that when truth is made known, right action follows. Now this, of course, assumes that the system is run by people of goodwill in the interests of an ascertainable public good. It's assuming a lot. Others urge the exclusive claims of teaching and basic research that would advance the theory and disciplinary practices. Now here, too, we have a con continuity for arguments about the appropriate use of anthropological skills. These have continued through the years. Today, probably more anthropologists hold positions outside academia than in, working as practicing anthropologists or applied anthropologists. And, of course, even 
even those in academic positions, do not necessarily sneer at the chance to work as a consultant. The association periodically tells us we must go out and make ourselves useful so that we will be valued by the general public and earn our keep. At the same time, status within the profession may well go to those who turn their attention to specialized esoteric subjects and write for fellow anthropologists or even for a restricted number of like-minded spirits. Probably we will continue to differ, and the centenary meeting of the association will find its members arguing about what makes an anthropologist, as well as what it is that anthropologists should be doing. The theoretical issues that informed discussion during the early meetings of the association have proved less lasting. They are no longer divisive, nor do they interest many of us. Some of them, of course, no longer interest us because they were explored so comprehensively in the 1940s and 1950s that there's nothing new to be said about them, and further research simply confirms what is already known. Thus it, is, thus it was with kinship studies, until technological developments made people rethink assumptions about what constitutes kinship. They then found new and interesting questions to pursue where the answers were not already boringly plain. Theoretical continuities between the 1940s and the present are to be found less in the theoretical questions that guide anthropological interests than in the persistence of theoretical battles within the profession, thereby provide, uh, producing a dialectic through which any momentary agreement gives rise to new divisions. In 1947, I found members claiming to disagree about what should constitute the subject matter of social anthropology and appropriate modes of analysis. They formed factions attributed to doctrinal differences, though they belonged, though who belonged to what faction might be in dispute. The major rift of the time would be said to reflect both geography and allegiance to a leader, for it pitted Oxford and LSE against each other. With the structural functionalism of Radcliffe Brown dominating the former, and the functionalism of Malinowski the latter, geographical outliers at Cambridge or University College sided with one or the other, or, if neutral, were likely to be claimed by both. That rift, of course, was soon to be superseded by others and more numerous rifts, as former allies drifted apart and found their own schools whose students happily entered the fray and insisted on ever widening the disagreements. The Manchester Department came into being in 1950, and soon after, there was a Manchester School. Cambridge was one for social anthropology, with the appointment of Meyer Fortis to the chair, I think about 1951, and Cambridge quickly acquired its own dogmas and ideas of superiority. And so it went. In such ways does the field of anthropology and the history of the association epitomize anthropological theory and illustrate how demographic and geographical factors affect human affairs. For what is factionalism but the playing out of fission and fusion in group formation and disintegration, the latter hindered and delayed by the existence of cross-cutting ties between the contenders? In 1947, however, people claimed doctrinal issues as the basis for their opposition. It was battles over the rival merits of structural functionalism and functionalism that enlivened ASA gatherings and sparked a determination to know what rivals might be up to that, we could, that could be used to undercut their position or suborn their supporters. From time to time it was muttered, so-and-so is really one of us. <laughs> suggesting that the person agreed to the rival doctrine only for tactical reasons associated with jobs and future advancement, while being at heart a follower of the true faith. Or the practicality of subversion was canvassed. In fact, as in so many factional studies, in 1947 it was often difficult for an outsider to see why people felt so strongly about what seemed to be minor disagreements. I fell into disgrace by saying that if someone trained in the United States, I couldn't see why they argued so vehemently and sometimes so intolerantly when they worked in much the same fashion and spoke much the same disciplinary language. 
for that matter, they were so few in number, uh, they couldn't have developed distinct dialects at that point. Mm -hmm. In those days before jet travel became available, or international conferences frequent, if they wanted to speak to anyone, they had to speak to each other. And for the moment, they were particularly loquacious because they had been separated during five years of war and were starved for anthropological talk. The more disputes, the better. And I should have recognized that difference is all. Divisiveness, therefore, has been an endemic element of the association's na na nature since its beginning. But then, division is a prerequisite of human social organization, and anthropologists are humans, despite being anthropologists. What is surprising is how often they ignore this, and seem surprised to discover that what they posit about the nature of social relationships applies to how they themselves interact with their fellows or others they encounter. In 1947, division did not preclude fellowship. It may now, given the size of the association, so that many now meet as unknown strangers. Originally, the members of the association formed a single, small, face-to-face -face gossiping community, even if some of them might be stationed in the Antipodes. They could count on other members of the association reading what they wrote. This is something present members may envy, until they may remember that this meant only about 30 readers. They met together in a single room, and afterwards foregathered in a single pub. In another context, Max Buckman once criticized the city planners responsible for the laying out of a new town because they had provided only one pub, whereas anyone with a sense of social dynamics knew that a community needed at least two. <laughs> now here he ignored anthropological history as the gathering in one pub long continued to be the hallmark of the discipline and was lauded for its furtherance of lively discussion, communal solidarity, and a symbolic link to that primal London club, a pub, where those attending Melanowski's seminar in the 1920s and 1930s adjourned. There, social anthropology might be said to have been born amidst the arguments of those who were then postgraduate students. The divisions and rivalries of 1947 have long since become history, vaguely remembered by only a few. They happened well before most of the present members of the ASA were born. So what about the intellectual contrib uh, contribution of the founders? If you are dismissive of, of their work, you may feel no compunction. They were equally dismissive of their predecessors. By 1947, paradigms had shifted and none of them claimed rivers, Hatton, or Merritt as ancestors. For the most part, they despised what they had written or grudgingly acknowledged the merit of an article or two, while pointing out how these have been surpassed. Even Malinowski was said by some who have lacked understanding of social structure and to be wrong about some other matters. Those who planned the con this conference on cosmopolitanism and anthropology have suggested that anthropological training is conducive to the cosmopolitan virtues that transcend the miracle the parochialism or ethnicisms of the nation state, and thus are prone to give em empathetic consideration to so-called others. <clears throat> now, we may be able to do that in some circumstances, <clears throat> but I would argue that we find it difficult to extend any such empathetic consideration to our own immediate forebears whose work is there to be transcended. We measure our advance by their shortcomings. Writing styles change, reflexively, Two, we project into the past what we take for granted about our own era. This is one of the problems, incidentally, with hindsight. Uh, what happened, having led to the present, becomes the inevitable outcome of the past, while what once seemed possible alternatives become inauthentic. It is no wonder if each generation of anthropologists sees the work of earlier generations slantwise and finds it difficult to understand why they paid attention to what, after all, now seem minor matters, cited what now seemed obvious, and seemed oblivious to what now would be foregrounded. Current members of the association may 
quite rightly think of themselves as far removed from the anthropology of the 1940s. They ask different questions, conceptualize their subject matter differently, and work in situations where their forerunners did not. Even the seniors among you are of another generation, and your interests, for the most part, are very different from those which preoccupied the men and women who founded the association. After all, you matured in a different world. Though you may sometimes cite them, you find it difficult to read what they wrote knowledgeably, because their vocabulary is now old-fashioned, and because you lack context, they took so much for granted that they did not realize they needed to supply them. In time, your own failure to provide such context, because you assume your readers know the background, guess what you write, will come back to haunt you when that background disappears. The truth is that those who founded the association had experienced a very specific world, which molded what they took for granted and what they challenged. They concentrated on what seemed important in their own time and place. Their research methods were also of the period. So let me try to give a context to their work. All the founders, say Bradford Brown and Brenda Sedigman, were students in the years between World War I and World War II. They began field work in the late 1920s or in the 1930s. And they usually went where no other anthropologist had set foot before, which in a way is a rather enviable thing, although it does have its drawbacks. Given the transportation available at the time, once arrived, they were usually confined to an area that could be covered by foot, bicycle, or canoe. In consequence, they concentrated on the people who lived in the small region immediately surrounding them. And what they knew about local links to the other areas were usually based on what local people told them. They didn't have the facilities to follow them in their travels, nor were they usually able to follow them over time. For when access to a place meant travel by ship, then rail, then truck, and then foot, once arrived, you stayed put until you left. And once you left, you did not expect to return. One result was that the field work experience for them was probably more intense than it can ever be today. Friends did not fly in from all over the world to pay a visit. Probably nobody within miles was a native speaker of your own language. Weekends in town were out of the question. You had no wireless or phone, and even the arrival of mail was occasional and could not be counted on. You and those you were working among were also unlikely to be bothered by frequent visits from officialdom or missionaries or NGOs. Perforce, you immersed yourself in what was happening locally and rarely came up for air. This had its repercussions on what field workers looked at. If kinship loomed large in their subsequent publications, this is because on the scale at which they were able to work, much of what happened was organized through kinship relationships, where they were, they were regarded as biological or fictional. Well, so while theoretical issues do guide field workers, in practice, feasibility dictates what they can do, as does the luck of the draw. That is the sheer serendipity of happening to be there when something happens. Those engaged in ethnographic research in the 1930s were certainly aware of the impact of colonial governments and international markets, but the conditions of the time made the rest of the world seem remote and not immediately important on the day-to-day -day basis. Much of the social anthropology written in the late 1940s and remember, this is all, most of it's based on work done in the 1930s. Lacks the global context that we would expect to find today. Historical context may also have been lacking. Although by the 1930s, some studies of social change had begun to appear. This, too, is a feature of the time in which their field work was carried out. In the first place, as students of Melanowski and Radcliffe Brown, they were in revolt against the conjectural history of the previous evolutionary and diffusionist anthropology. There were also empiricists. Social anthropology, they thought, should deal with the contemporary, with what they could see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears. Their time span, therefore, was as limited as their spatial span. The one-time field visit was the order of the day. 
long-term research with repeated visits, now so taken for granted, was a thing of the future. Isaac Shapira being a notable exception here. They usually had no way to check on whether what they observed was representative of other times, except from what people told them about the past. And they were leery of such accounts because it was accepted knowledge that myths and other tales of the past are social charters that validate present institutions and hierarchies. <coughs> they were lucky if any previous visitor to the area or any local person had published an account against which they could measure their own findings. Archives were scattered and access might be closed or given only on stipulations that made it wiser to avoid them. Written histories of a country or region were rare. Historians weren't interested in working where they worked. Historians arrived along with sociologists, political scientists, and economists only in the 1950s and 1960s when living conditions were more nearly approached those they were accustomed to at home. So the con uh, then also in the 1950s and uh, 60s, scholarly work by local historians and social scientists began to become common as students emerged from the newly founded national universities. The lack of global and historical context in much of what was being written when the association was founded now seems glaringly apparent in a period when we take for granted that our field notes can be supplemented by newspaper and wireless reports and by an abundance of documentation supplied by those in other disciplines and that we ourselves pay repeated visits and be that between the visits, the post, the telephone, and the internet keep us in touch with those we have worked among. Often enough, we look over the shoulders of ethnographers who describe the area in the earlier decades. Whether we like it or not, currently it is hard not to walk in others' footprints, determining the history of their own time. And they gave primacy to such factors in pursuing their own research agendas. With the exception of Radcliffe Brown and Brenda Seligman, they had grown up in the years after World War I, a war that put paid to 19th century illusions about progress and European rationality. All of them had experienced the Great Depression of the 1930s, when the economic collapse beggared many, brought on massive unemployment, and put in question the viability of economic systems based on the market. As field workers in the late 1920s and 1930s, they found themselves among people who relied upon land or water to supply the majority of their needs. Now, when markets crash, as they did in the 1930s, those who can support themselves off the land are arguably better off than those who have come to depend upon a market economy that betrays them. A certain wariness of technological and economic innovation was therefore characteristic of this generation of anthropologists. As incidentally, it was of many colonial officials who had no desire to see the people they administered become as poverty-stricken and traumatized as those in their home country who were dependent upon the road. The rise of the rise of passive sorry. The rise of fascism and Nazism in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s also left them suspicious of the superiority of political and economic systems that provided the seed beds from which these emerged. Several had left European homelands when they became at risk as Hitler rose to power, and others had lived with the knowledge that their lives might well be forfeit if Britain was successfully invaded. The superior, superiority of Western values and Western institutions was not nearly as taken for granted as it was in later prosperous decades, when technological advances seemed to promise the end of drudgery and poverty, and there was glib talk of modernization and the end of poverty throughout the world. In the 1930s and the 1940s, some of them saw communism as a viable and relatively benign alternative to Nazism or the capitalism which had devastated Western economies. But I don't think that in 1947, any of them wanted to live under such a system. Socialism was more congenial, especially in the terms preached by the British Fabians and the then Labour Party, newly come to power. In 1946, they had just emerged from World War II, 
which had dominated their lives for five years. Some had been on the battle lines. Others were survivors of the London Blitz. Their students in 1946, for some years thereafter, were mostly war veterans. Rationing was still on, and the food search was a constant reminder of the basic importance of provisioning in determining both what people do and what they think about. All were undergoing something of an identity crisis as they shifted from familiar wartime roles and statuses. When they turned again to writing up their neglected field notes, usually stemming from the late 1930s, they had much on their minds that influenced how they analyzed what they had recorded. If they preferred people as they had found them, it was because they were not at all certain that those who promised them a better future if they changed could deliver on such promises. Instead, they were likely to respect the political economies, ritual orders, and dogmatic beliefs they described as viable alternative systems of order. That is, ideal models of alternative reality, and unfortunately, from which much of the contention caused by perceptions of inequality and other evils were eliminated. This left them open to charges of sentimentality and antiquarianism, or even worse, paternalism, especially some decades later, when newly independent countries wrenched themselves away from colonial domination, but chose to adopt institutions which they saw as having led to the empowerment of Europeans. But if the 1930s had let those who founded the association, and many others of their period, skeptical of the long-term viability of European institutions, the superiority of European values, or any innate superior, superiority of Europeans or those of European descent. That skepticism, I suspect, is shared by many of you at the present time who have new reasons to worry about what the Western trajectory is, where the Western trajectory is heading. Again, whatever their ethnic background, their intellectual stance was one of resistance to creeds that preach racial inferiority or justified the subordination of others on racial grounds. The South Africans among them were particularly vehement in this respect. Now you may say yes, but they accepted and served colonialism. And this is true, but only up to a point. They may not have demanded that Britain immediately dismantle its colonial empire, but think for a moment. In the 1930s, that would have meant that other colonial powers would have moved in to take over. They thought some colonial regimes better than others, and I think they were probably right. They saw their own role as one of providing a body of knowledge that could be used to inform and reform colonial policy in general, and the way administrative and technical officers worked at the local level. Colonial governments certainly did not regard them as reliable upholders of the system. Rather, they were seen as critics of the colonial order, under suspicion as possible agents of subversion, especially since their fraternization with local people did not conform to colonial etiquette and might give people ideas. There's certain irony in this, since local people were likely to suspect them of spying for the colonial government. But then suspicion of the field worker goes with the role. While working on the Macaw Reservation in 1941-42, I was suspected of being a German spy. In Northern Rhodesia during the colonial regime, the administration watched to see if I were preaching subversive communism. While well, local people thought I was an oddball member of the administration, but the less dangerous because I was a woman. In independent Zambia, suspicion continued, but in a new guise. Any American anthropologist is undoubtedly a potential worker for the CIA. So anthropological curiosity is rarely seen as an adequate explanation for the presence of persistent questioning of someone alien to the system. So you may say you have solved such problems by carrying out your ethnography at home rather than in places where you would be alien. And so you have obliterated the, de the, the dichotomy between the us and the other that mars the work of your predecessors. That, of course, subverts the idea of that anthropology is cosmopolitan in approach and tries to transcend boundaries to reach an empathetic understanding of others. It's also based on a false assumption that home is a homogenized place where people think and act the same way and share the same tradition. 
whereas it's likely to be a meeting place of many communities who relate to each other in different ways. <coughs> Assumptions of homogeneity uh, came to be seen as one of the distorting weaknesses of the social anthropology of the 1940s, when attention shifted to the roles played by conflicting constructs, situational choices, and competing power agents. But even if one could assume homogeneity, returning home does not solve for the anthropologists the problems of alienation caused by the dichotomy between the us and the other. Built into the very nature of anthropology is the necessity for comparison, if only to celebrate the unique. And comparison always raises the possibility of, law of alternative standards. It requires one to stand off and look, especially at the familiar, as something that requires explanation and needs justification as one more alternative human arrangement. One questions what others see as natural and right, the guarantors of their own self-worth and superiority. We do this to foreground it for study. The alien who cannot be expected to do, who needs instruction, may be seen as less subversive than the one who should understand and accept the basic premises by which people live. So long as our goals include contributing to the ethnographic record that makes comparison possible and inevitable, we share with our president successors whatever, wherever we work, this quality of being other. Now, you may have noticed that throughout this talk, I have spoken as an old-fashioned social anthropologist, and I have held the anthropological victim that one must stand off and critique Whatever, whatever it is one looks at, including one's own society. But one does so in order to acquire a deeper understanding. Though my ethnography may be faulty, since it relies on undocumented memory, I have tried to do something with anthropological analysis of the association and its members at its inception. The association was founded by people of a given time who had learned to question their own society because they had so often found it wanting. Their ethnographic work may deal with other people, but it contributed to what, after all, has been the primary role of anthropology, the recording of the spectrum of human ingenuity that in turn foregrounds the familiar world at home and so opens it to informed thought. In doing this, anthropologists, of course, are encroached upon the realm of social philosophers, moralists, religious thinkers, and other social critics. Their anthropology has influenced Western thought and taught others to think in terms they introduced. It directed attention to the narrowness of vision of economists, sociologists, psychologists, and humanitarians who unthinkingly adopted Western yardsticks and assumed the givenness of Western categories. One has only to read and listen to catch echoes of what they said in rote in the common parlance of scholarship and popular culture. This has been absorbed into the culture of the cosmopolitan, globalized world of the 21st century. Those who founded the association left an organization which continues to be divisive, I hope, and productive of new thought. They left an ethnographic tradition built on respect for others. Some other things remain to you, including the way your own thought has been molded by their impact on Western civilization and the times that have formed you.